Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and on this very, very special holiday edition of L'Chaim here on Shalom TV, I have an extraordinary opportunity. Lucky, lucky me. Some of you who have been watching me for a long time know that in addition to my first love, which is everything having to do with the Jewish tradition, the Jewish people, the state of Israel, you also know that I've had the privilege of being involved with theater. Some on stage, a great deal of production work, and I've been privileged to be producing both on Broadway, off Broadway, and it has brought me into contact with some extraordinary entertainers, individuals who work behind the scenes, directors, people in every facet of theater work. And I've come to appreciate, and, and I use that word very carefully, I've come to appreciate the extraordinary talent that goes into the men and women who have the courage to get up on stage and to perform and to entertain and to thrill us with a range of theatrical experiences that touch the heart, move the mind. The gentleman I want to introduce you to on this edition of L'Chaim is someone I have the utmost regard and appreciation for. This is the first time I've had a chance to speak with him one-on-one, -on -one, although our paths have crossed many times. We happen to enjoy the same New York restaurant and the same maitre d'. We love you, Paul. But this is a gentleman who has become an American icon in the comedic world, who has done extraordinary things in the world of film. You've seen many of his wonderful films. In television, and he's won two Emmy Awards. In a series of spectacularly successful theatrical one-man shows, and I told him off camera, for one of his shows, I went back time and time again just to study what he was doing to his extraordinary work as a stand-up comedian. He has his own unique art in the stand-up comedic role, and it's an art that's been appreciated by his peers. He was voted one of the top 50 comedians of all time. And while individuals make contributions of their own in various segments of the entertainment industry, this artist is an, ent an entertainment industry in and of himself. And most important for this context, you know there are many, many, many Jews in the theatrical world, in the world of theater, in the world of film, in the world of television. Very often, Jews in the entertainment world want to downplay their Jewish identity. It's almost as if they feel it will be a handicap in their work. In contrast, this individual is a proud, fiercely proud, ever-present Jew who has made a contribution not only in the world of entertainment, but also in speaking his mind on Jewish affairs and Jewish topics. For me, it is his insight as well as his comedic wit that make him a unique presence on the American scene. It is an honor to be sitting with Jackie Mason, and I thank you for allowing me into your home to give me a few moments. Thank I'm you very, sorry, very I'm much. I'm sorry that you didn't have a kind word to say about me. <laughs> well, that's what, I'm very disappointed that I didn't. I'll do it. better next time. I, boy, I want to know, I adore what you do. Thank you. And I feel you have made an indelible mark on the arc of American theater, and you've been doing it now it's for a, many, so many the years. The whole introduction is a great tribute to your intelligence, too, <laughs> that you saw so much of the significance of what I'm doing. I did. And you had the insight to be aware and to understand it as well as you do, uh, not only to articulate it so well, I'm very proud of your ability in this bit. Thank you. So you are part of a generation, you are part of a family, four generations of rabbis. Four, correct. Right. 
um, your great your great great grandfather, your grandfather, your great grandfather, your grandfather, your father, and three of your brothers are rabbis, and you have smicha, which you got at the age of twenty five. Right. And for a very brief period of time, you did actually serve in a congregation. Is that correct? Right. Okay. By the way, in in the sh one of the shows, and I kept going back and back. I would wait for the coda of the show, where you sat on the side of the stage and reminisced. I assume it was also, I mean, I don't think you were just reminiscing out of nowhere. It was scripted. But I want, wanted to know whether the, what, what I was hearing had a kernel of the truth as well. Sure. For you, you are a rabbi. You come from a family, a lineage of rabbis. Was it hard for you? Was it hard for your father when you decided that you wanted to go into the world of entertainment and leave the pulpit? The truth of the matter is it wasn't that hard for my father because my father never knew that I became a comedian. I kept lying to him because my father was living in his own world of, of the rabbinate, of Orthodox Judaism, and he wasn't uh, really in contact with the, with the world outside in such depth and, so, and he didn't see the significance of what was actually going on in the outside world. It's a very limited, yes. very narrow kind of sphere of, of life that a very strict Orthodox Jew lives. They live in their own world with their own friends, their own people, their own language, and the rest of the world uh, they exist to them, but in, in no significant way that they mm -hmm. were really in contact with it. And because they're not, it very, was very, very easy to lie to my father about what I'm doing because he never saw where, or was aware of where I was going. If I said to him, I'm going to shul to pray, and I, instead I went to a nightclub, there was no way he would know about it. Mm -hmm. If I went on television, he wouldn't even know about it because he didn't ever watch American television. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't involved in it, he had no connection to it. As a matter of fact, it's considered almost a sin to watch television because it divides you, or it might be something uh, crude, or what, uh, according to orthodoxy, is considered sinful, or, or vulgar, or dirty. Or just a or waste immoral. of time. Or it, on every level, it was considered unacceptable to have any connection to it. So they didn't even watch it. They weren't so you didn't so tell him? Had, so I never told them. What about your mother? I felt compassion is more important than truth. There's, no, there's nothing holy about telling the truth if it's going to destroy somebody. Mm -hmm. People say, but what if a person doesn't look so hot and says to you, how do I look? What are you going to tell them? To me, I'll be honest with you. It's bad. You're not going to tell them that. You're going to tell them what a handsome mm -hmm. person he is. Mm -hmm. You don't feel guilty for lying. You feel like a, like, a, like a sadistic human being if you ever told the truth. And that would have been what I was if I told my father the truth. So I never told him and he never knew. And even when I became somewhat of a hit, and he was still living, thank God, at the time, he didn't hear about it. Mm -hmm. People would come over to me and said, I saw you, you were great on television yesterday. They thought maybe I was watching television. They don't know what, what, they, what he was even talking about. True for your mother as well? Right. Interesting. How about your brothers who were also rabbis? Did they in any way resent yes. what you did? They didn't exa they, I would say they did resent it until I started to make money. Mm -hmm. When I started to make money, they resented it less and less. And then when I started giving them all the money I was making, they started to resent it even less than that. Mm -hmm. Then they started to hope that I don't quit so I could help out. And before you know it, they were thanking God I'm a comedian. I were calling every day, fearful that I might decide <laughs> <laughs> that I might become a rabbi. Mm -hmm. So it went from becoming the worst crime not to be a rabbi to the, to the lowest thing on earth if I became a rabbi. <laughs> you understand, as we hear this, there's, there's a wonder as to whether it was hard on you emotionally, whether you told your father, you didn't tell your father, your brother. At some point, you are doing, you are making a significant break with a family tradition. Right. How did you feel about that? I felt very guilty about it at the beginning, but little by little I felt less and less guilty because the truth of the matter is that I wasn't really as religious as a, as a rabbi should be, and I would have felt more guilty if I became mm -hmm. a rabbi because I would have been a hypocrite. I was, I was not particularly as religious as a rabbi I should be. And I started to doubt the level of my religious convictions. I wasn't sure how much I believed in this. So I, I felt a kind of freedom, emancipation, mm -hmm. for my own conscience to do what I was doing. So I felt less and less guilty as long as I, as long as I was protecting this whole story from my father. 
it, it bothered me very little. I understand. If my father knew when I, and I, I heard him, the whole thing would have troubled me a lot. Mm -hmm. But he, thank God he never knew. I understand. Incidentally, what was the tenor of your Jewish home? Was it, as you look back at it, Jackie, did you love it as a child or was it a, was it a burden for you? It wasn't particularly a burden for me. The only burden was the poverty. The poverty. Right. Mm -hmm. We were a very poor family. My father had trouble making a living all the time. Mm -hmm. He had a shul. He didn't have a shul. He had a job. He almost had a job. He was very stringent in his convictions, and he was very uncompromising. So in, mo in most situations, he, he, he was an impractical type of person. He didn't really fit in, and he didn't really ever bend mm -hmm. to any real problems. Mm -hmm. All he knew was what he had to do, and before you know it, it was a very rough life. I was mm -hmm. eating uh, a banana from a month ago. I was, I was sitting on a chair that uh, was broke about a year ago. Uh, I was the, there was no room in the bed. I had to sleep on the floor on a fire escape. Uh, I had to make a call to find out if somebody has enough money for a sandwich. It was a rough life. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what attracted you to the world of entertainment in general and comedy in particular? What attracted me was when I became a rabbi and I started to do sermons. And I would throw in some jokes here and there in the sermon that was appropriate to the occasion. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't do things that, that uh, were inappropriate, that would uh, screw up the significance of the message by making some kind of a mockery of it. But I was doing comedy but that might fit the situation. And before you know it, I was getting more and more laughs. Then I was getting so many laughs, I forgot what I was going to say. And the people weren't interested in the message, they came for the joke. And I said on the stage on, on Broadway, which is true, the word got out that there's a rabbi there that's hilarious. And before you know it, the Gentiles started to come. <laughs> and the Gentiles came to, in such numbers that there was no room for the Jews. And before you know it, I became the only rabbi of a Gentile congregation. <laughs> That's the joke I did on Broadway, yes. but, but it's basically true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, you make comedy look easy. I know it isn't easy. And I saw something you wrote many years ago, where, and if I don't know the exact, you'll correct me. I think you said something like, and you were doing one of your one-man shows on Broadway, and you said that your goal is there should not be more than a certain interval between laughs, right? Yeah. I thought it was five seconds. I don't remember what the actual thing was. But I, never, I never in my life thought of it in terms of a precise timing. Okay. But I thought of it in principle. In principle, I feel that comedians waste your time a lot setting up a joke, developing a theme and a thought and a story. They love to hear themselves talking. They're talking about nothing. People are getting nauseous. They would rather hear a joke than hear the introduction to a joke. <laughs> mm -hmm. they, and they're not interested in your opinions. I, I talk about opinions just as, as fodder for the, for the punchline. Yes. As a, on my way to the punchline, I, I like to set up a, th a thought, an idea to make the situation look funnier. If I say uh, a man and a woman had a fight, and she said this and he said that, and it's not half as funny if I say what caused the fight and how they got into it, and now you get more emotionally involved. The more an audience is involved emotionally, the, the funnier the comedy becomes. If it comes out of a situation that really envelops you, if you're just peripherally interested, the left is never half as big as if you give it a kind of emotional involvement that creates a fascination with yes, the thought. Yes. The, there has to be a fascination with the idea before the left comes, and then the left is 10 times higher. Now, so you have to make it believable first. Every time you talk to a Jew, he's going to a doctor. He's coming from a doctor, he's looking for a doctor. Every Gentile is going for a beer, and every Jew is going to a doctor. <laughs> they ask him, why are you going to a doctor? Are you sick? Not right now, but I'm not going to wait till the last minute. <laughs> you virtually write all your material? Right. Okay. Is it hard for you to write? It's definitely hard. To perfect the piece of material, to get it to the level of perfection that suits me is, is definitely hard mm -hmm. work. It takes a lot of effort and concentration. Some come, some come faster or easier than others. But in general, it's very hard work. Because, One of those because the first time I get a thought that this is a funny situation, I try to pun develop a lot of punchlines involved in it to make it as funny as I can. And I'm never happy 
but how funny I made it because I always feel there's room to make it funnier. And I keep searching how to make it even funnier, how to get more and more laughs out of any situation that I go into. So that every situation I go into should get screams all the way. If I hear the laughs are only mediocre, I either keep struggling with it or I get out of it. Mm -hmm. I don't want the audience to ever linger through something that's only half half baked or slightly funny, moderately funny. I want them to be flying from the furniture. We fly most of the time, by the way. What's that? We fly most of the time. Right. You're extraordinarily successful. The other thing that I want you to talk about for a moment, when I watch what you do, the humor you are building upon yeah. is observations you have uh, very often about human nature in general. There is, by the way, humor you do specifically on Jewish human nature. I want to hold that for a moment. Right. But your gift is that you are able to look at the way people think, live, behave, and see humor in human nature. Right. Talk to me about how that developed for you, because my instinct is, here you are, a young guy, you're 25, 26, you were probably, you were performing, if I'm not correct, you, you might mistake it, even when you were like, like 24 years old. Right. Okay. So very young, you're already trying this out. Right. And you become one of the early pioneers of political sati satirical humor of your generation. Right. Obviously there was a Will Rogers. Right. But when you started to do this, and there was a bite to what you were doing, it was all about saying something about who we are and revealing something about ourselves in a way that made us both laugh and I believe understand more about ourselves. And how does that develop? How does Jackie Mason develop that? I never that? particularly was aware that I was developing it. I was just uh, naturally always making fun of people and their contradictions and their behavior, their pretensions, all the complexes that people have of, uh, in general and that people like to think they're very logical when most of the time they're kidding themselves to save their own egomania. Mm -hmm. And I say that most people are egomaniacs by nature. They don't know how much of an egomaniac they are, but most people are very sick and almost in one way or another. And they like to think that they're doing everything for logical reasons when very few things are logical. And it turns out that, that almost everything they're doing is some kind of a fake. They're lying to themselves to make themselves feel better, or they're giving themselves excuses for everything they're doing wrong, or stupid, or selfish, and they find excuses to justify everything they do. And those justifications uh, create mountains of, ex of reasons for comedy. And that's what you try to exploit. Right. Okay. Now talk about the Jewish humor in, in particular. What I no, mean by that is... that's because I am, happen to be a Jew, and I'm in the Jewish world a lot. And I see the Jewish complexes very clearly yes. because it's all around me, and so I make a lot of fun of it. But, and, and then I see the differences between Jews and Gentiles but, and everything I do. Yes, but you, my point to you is we're all aware. You are able to see it. You know, in a, in a rabbinic sense of the word drash, you see it, because, and therefore you're able to expose it. Because I, try to, because I try harder than most people to see what's wrong with people. I'm by nature a student of human nature. That's right. That's my point. So I, I, like, I enjoy studying their complexes. So I, my, most people might ignore it. They don't care about it. I have, I'm fascinated with it. So I'm expressing my own fascination with the sicknesses I see in people. I call it sicknesses. I mean complexes. Yes. Right. And Jewish people have certain complexes that are particular to the Jews. Like what the, is like our complex? What is a Jewish that. complex? A Jewish complex is to, to show off a lot desperately searching for identity, trying to prove that there's somebody here. You ask a Gentile what he does for a living, he'll tell you, I'm a, I'm a plumber. Or a Jew will tell you, I have a, I'm in the plumbing business. <laughs> I say, where do you live? I live across the street. Or a Jew will tell you, I have two toilets and four bedrooms. <laughs> Before he even tells you where he lives. You never find out where he lives because that was the question. But on the way, he'll, say, he'll tell you, he'll find excuses to tell you how his son is number one in his class and his, his daughter almost became a doctor and his father is still a lawyer even though he's not working. And, and he'll give you 20 reasons to think of him as a top man in the neighborhood even though he's still accomplishing nothing and he's sitting in his chair looking, waiting to get a job. No Jew is out of work. Every Jew, when a Gentile is not working, I'm unemployed. A Jew is not working. I, they downsized the, my company. 
Every jeweler comes from a downsized company. A Gentile is fired, a Jew is downsized. They, uh, you could go on like this forever. There's yes. a, Jews are all full of diseases and complexes, <laughs> 10 times more than Gentiles. A, Jew, a Gentile comes over and says, I enjoy your work. A Jew says, well, I used to like you better. <laughs> You're still good, but it's not the same. I just came to say hello for my sister. She loves you. I, I'll tell you the truth, it's not for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to give you a couple of your own lines, and I want yeah. you to tell me where it comes from. Yeah. You talk about how a Jew enters a restaurant. Right. As That's if my it, biggest number. Yeah, tell to this me. day, every time I go into a restaurant, I hear comments about it. The head it's waiters, the fabulous. waiters. It's fabulous. They all have heard it from all the Jews, <laughs> and they, the, the Jews repeat it, and the head waiters, and the, I hear this from everybody. And the, and the basic message of it is? That a Jew is full of complexes, that he has to feel important wherever he goes. And he, enters he needs recognition to And when he to enters a restaurant, he yes. enters like? Like a partner. Like a partner. Right. Do you understand how true that is? Do I understand? Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm, the, I'm the guy that, that wrote it, so I must understand how true. Uh -huh. And why does a Jew All you look have to at do him? Is sit on a chair and take a look. <laughs> a Jew is immediately picking furniture. And he immediately needs everybody to notice. And when a Gentile tells you he goes to a restaurant, but a good restaurant, he tells you how good the food is. A Jew starts off by telling you how the guy says hello. <laughs> as soon as I came in, you thought, oh, what a fantastic place. The boss right away he came over to me, hello. He doesn't leave me alone. He came to my table at least eight times. He didn't even talk to anybody else. And this comes from a Jewish what? A Jewish complex of, inf uh, of feel uh, feeling left out in a society of coming from a refugee situation, of being a nobody in a, in a world of Gentiles, and the one that's feeling in, uh, excommunicated or uh, who's, who's searching for identity. He's not, he doesn't feel like he has any recognition in terms of a Jew. A Jew is always the one ignored or avoided or, or discriminated against in general. So he was always the left out person in every place he went. Mm -hmm. So he has to prove that he's in. In case you think he's nobody, because Jew was always identified as the nobody in the situation. Mm -hmm. Jackie, as you look at American Jewry today, how would you assess the level of insecurity or security American Jews feel about their place in America? I don't think the young Jews have uh, feel these complexes one tenth as much as the old Jews do, because through their generation, the world has changed in the past twenty years. So, People don't see the, themselves as left out as uh, an 18-year-old Jewish kid doesn't even identify with a lot of what I'm saying because really? they haven't experienced anything of, uh, very much of this kind. An 18-year-old kid 20, 30 years ago was never accepted in the, in, in the college when he went to college. He wasn't accepted in the uh, organizations, what do you call that, the uh, fraternities. The fraternities uh, in, in the uh, the Gentiles wouldn't even talk to him. He was considered the Jew, the Jew. He was identified as a Jew. If you were nice to a Jew, you were an exceptionally nice guy because most of them didn't accept the Jew and they thought of him as people who don't belong. So mm -hmm. you went through this. They're not going through any of this today. Mm -hmm. Today, Jews and Gentiles mix very freely and comfortably. There's, most Gentiles don't have any, any feeling of discrimination against Jews. Mm -hmm. There still exists in the upper crusts among the upper crust Gentiles, there's still condominiums even in New York, where a Jew could never buy a get in, in, the, in some of the co-op buildings on Fifth Avenue. And there are still golf clubs and country clubs where a Jew could never become a member, even though the law is against it. So they have to hide their identity, or it becomes a problem. And there's still discrimination. But it's a subtle kind of discrimination on certain very peculiarly unique levels, mm -hmm. not as a general pattern of behavior. The general pattern of behavior among Gentiles is no special problem among whether they're quite, it's no special identification with religion at all. Blacks and whites among kids play together and work together, they don't even notice that you're black anymore. It's amazing when you talk to 20 year old kids and you see them, you'll see black and whites at the table together and dining together and playing together. Among 40, 50 year old people who go into a restaurant, you almost see never blacks and whites together at a table, unless if you do see them, it's almost always a business meeting. Every time I see blacks and whites at the same table in a restaurant, I ask, who are these people? He asked the waiter. Do you know them? 
-hmm. And I always find out it's a business meeting. Mm -hmm. So it's a contrived friendship. Mm -hmm. It's not the, because as soon as they leave that table, they'll never see each other socially on a personal basis. Very little. Even today, if, if they're over 40, you will hardly ever see a white guy calling up a black person for, for a cup of coffee. And among young people, very different. Right. Mm -hmm. It's very changing very rapidly. It's changing rapidly among Fegelach. Take a look at the difference towards a homosexual person today or as little as five years ago. Ten years ago, it was a totally different world. A Fegel was looked at as a sick person who needs help. Then there's the psychiatrist who just died recently who made a trailblazing revelation about 20 years ago when he, when he, when he made the pronouncement after great involvement with, with huge studies that he's not sick, it's just an alternative lifestyle. Mm -hmm. and, and they stopped sending Fegelach for treatment because there was no such thing as a sickness connected with it. After his great revelation, little by little, they began to realize or to believe that it's no sickness and it doesn't require any treatment because it's not a person with a problem. But it, the, but it was taken for granted that these people have a severe problem who need help till this guy, this particular psychiatrist, came out with this whole revelation. All of this is a positive in your mind, is it not? It's positively a positive. I don't see why... You should look at a fagel uh, as a man with a problem. But if he's, you know, if there's some people who may normal, be offended. If he's a normal fagel. Are you, are you, are you, do you ever I'm say very that? aware as I'm saying the white fagel yes. that a lot of people are going to be offended yes. that I say fagel. But I'm purposely saying it. Because? Because I want them to realize that there's nothing wrong with a fagel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever in your own career face some problem because you were so openly Jewish? Oh, I certainly did. I certainly did that. I remember when I was traveling the country as a comedian 35 years ago, or even 25 years ago, that uh, whenever I said I was a, a Jew, or, or, or Gentiles recognized me as a Jew, uh, that I saw that but, uh, I saw discrimination every place. I, saw, I, I played in certain golf clubs where I told jokes, but I couldn't stay there after the show. Because it was a Gentile club, they, they thought I was a great comedian, they hired me to play there, and after the show, I had to get out of the building. <laughs> uh, Sammy Davis Jr. experienced this in Miami Beach. He played in Miami Beach because he was such a huge star, but he couldn't stay in the same hotel that he played. Mm -hmm. You know, there is this apocryphal myth of enormous proportion about the fight you had with Ed Sullivan. Right. And I don't know the extent to which the details that have come down to us are true. Were you, in fact, blackballed after the Ed Sullivan spat where he said you gave him the finger and, right. you, and he wouldn't let I you I wasn't back officially on? blackballed, but a lot of people wouldn't hire me after that because they thought I was an uncontrollable sicko who suddenly could do anything vulgar or dirty on television. If I could do that on television because they believed what Ed Sullivan said was true. So oh, as much as I, as much as I, you won a lawsuit did, in this area. I made a, I made a lawsuit against him, and I won right away. And you won, right? And he did have you back on once, right? Correct, right? During the period where you were, in fact, banned from the show, other, other shows wouldn't use wouldn't me. use you. Also, oh, right? That so, must so, have been a very hard period for you. It was, it was because I was, I was a shooting star, flying up to the top, and all of a sudden. They started going up, and so all of a sudden the same shooting star went backwards. And all of a sudden I was making half the money that I made before. I still was a hit in certain places, mm -hmm. and there was enough places that hired me. But the whole image was destroyed. Of a hot new young comedian, I became the guy what you should watch out for. Mm -hmm. Because if you hire him, who knows what he's going to do. You better leave him alone. Mm -hmm. How did it finally change for you, Jackie? It changed with this Broadway show. Which was many, in 1986. Which was about, which was about 15, 20 years after the, the incident happened. Mm -hmm. I was playing The it. world according to me. Right. That really put you back on the map. Right. It was an extraordinary hit. Right. You went time and time again. Right. But you had a period where it was very hard right. on you. It, it wasn't Did so hard financially. I was still making a comfortable living. It was hard ah. emotionally because... Because uh, my, I was you a, had been a huge because star. Because here I am, right. an ambitious egomaniac, 
like every other actor. <laughs> and every actor who tells you he's not trying to become a star, he just hopes to be working. He's a liar because he knows he doesn't have a chance or he's afraid to have that much ambition because he might not have a chance. And the, the chance of becoming a star sounds so remote when you're not working or you're just making a little money that you convince yourself you're not looking for recognition on that level. You just want to enjoy the idea of being a comedian or an actor. So they convinced themselves that that would be enough because they got nothing altogether. As soon as you get a little something, you start getting desperate to become a hit. Then you become desperate to become a big hit. It's not like an accountant. If an accountant is working, he's happy. So he's not trying to be the world's biggest accountant. <laughs> <laughs> and you're but, aware of your yeah. own desire for real success in this area. Right. Uh, Why not? You? I'm working for nothing, so it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> but during that period of time, did it make you bitter, Jackie? Not bitter, but I, I, well, I never became bitter. I, I was thinking of when and how I, I could overcome this problem. But I wouldn't say I ever became bigger. And I never was walking around miserable. If you, if you saw me in a coffee shop, you didn't think I was suffering because I wasn't. I was just thinking of what to do about it. I said to myself, life is too short to take this so seriously. If you're Good lucky freedom. enough to be making thousands of dollars a week instead of millions, it's not such a bad life. And if you take it so seriously, you're just wasting your life for, because you're not going to be here forever. I was very angry for every, you. Every hour you spend crying about something you can't do nothing about, you're not going to change what happened. I say to myself, for all my life, this is my philosophy. If you can't fix it, forget it. Think of something else that you should do about it. Don't cry over yesterday's news, which can't be helped. Almost every time you talk to somebody, they tell you what somebody did to him. But he did it already. What are you talking about? <laughs> so now, as you look back on the Jewish origin, which at some point you, it wasn't you rejected, but you did leave the world in which you were raised. Right. How do you feel now about the Jewish tradition? I mean, you're not an Orthodox Jew. Right. But you're clearly a passionate Jew who cares very much about the state of Israel. I'll talk to you about that in one moment. But before Israel, where are you now personally, do you feel, in your own attachment to embracing or not embracing of the Jewish tradition? I embrace tradition? the Jewish tradition in, in terms of traditions completely. I don't, I'm not a religious Jew, but the traditions of Judaism I think are beautiful and I think they're holy. The values, the basic values of Judaism, that what you're taught and raised with as a Jew, I think are the most beautiful values in the world. The fact that it's distorted by a lot of Jews and they behave differently than the Jewish values are taught, is the complexes that go into people that have nothing to do with the values in the first place. Mm -hmm. They are violating those values or they're being sinful in, about those values. But the values themselves are beautiful. When people see a Jew behaving in a, in a way that's ugly to them, they say, look at what Jews do. This guy did it. It's not the, what, the, what the Jews are were taught to do. It's like you see criminals in society. You can't blame the society, you blame the criminal. You don't say, therefore, democracy doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You say, this person is a low life, and you get even with him, not with democracy. You still preserve democracy even though you want to get rid of him. <laughs> is there one or even two? If somebody said to you, what is what are to Jackie Mason? What are an example? What's an example of what you consider to be a quintessential East Jewish value? Is there something you could articulate? I don't think there's any one quintessential Jewish value. If, if, if Jews believe in love, in, in love, could you? Is that the only the most important value? Integrity, honesty, mm -hmm. is also just as important. Mm -hmm. So now come to Israel. There's a lot of values that are important. Not to gain weight too much is also <laughs> important. <laughs> come to Israel for me. You have been involved in speaking out in ways that most public entertainers do not do. Raoul Felton, you wrote a book. Right. Um, you have been strong in your feelings about what Israel should or should not do in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. First of all, do you go to Israel at all? I've been there three times. Okay. When you're there, do you feel in some way it has a special claim on you? I don't feel Israel has a claim on me. 
I just feel proud and happy that the Jews have a place to be, have a society that they, that they could call their own, like other people do. And that to, to protect it and defend it is very important to me. Mm -hmm. And what about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? What do you, how do you see it? I see it the way every Jew sees it. The Palestinians just have a false feeling of, of, uh, that the Jews have taken over their land when in fact they've taken over the Israeli land. They don't belong there and Israel knows that they don't belong there. Historically, biblically, throughout, every, by every principle, by every standard, everybody knows it's the Jewish land. And we gave up half of our land to them in an effort to keep peace. It's just like uh, somebody's making a claim on Florida. The guy doesn't belong there in the first place, but in order to achieve peace, you say here, Florida is half yours. Mm -hmm. Is that close enough? You don't belong there in the first place. If I gave you half my money when you're not entitled to none of it, but because you're bothering me so much and you convinced yourself and you believe it, it's not like the Palestinians don't believe it. It, it doesn't come from just anti-Semitism like the Nazis. It comes from a genuine belief that it's their land. So you try to make peace with them. Mm -hmm. And no matter what, how much we gave up, and no matter what ways we acquiesced, by literally giving up half of our land, it's, it's, it still can't satisfy them because they feel the Jews don't belong there at all and they're determined to destroy them if they stay there. So how could we make peace with a person who's out to destroy you because he believes you don't belong there in the first place? Mm -hmm. So this distortion is so genuine that it's almost impossible to make peace with them. If, we keep thinking if we give up more and we come more and more compromises, take a look at this issue with the settlements. Is there more, more stupid than that? If six Jews build, extend a kitchen or a toilet, they say we're destroying the peace process because six more Jews saying prayers <laughs> extended a bathroom because it's their land. Meanwhile, there's two million Arabs <laughs> living in Israel. Among these two million Arabs, there's plenty of Arabs determined to wipe us out. And we still not only give them equal rights, they're in our own government. Even though they're our worst enemies determined to kill us, they know the Jews are not determined to kill them. So we're no threat to them when we move into, into an extra settlement or an extra block, an extra mile or an extra kitchen. We're no threat to them. They are a genuine threat to us. They told us they are. They're telling you, I'm coming there to kill you. What do I want to do? I want to move in right next to you. So if I want to kill you, I shouldn't have to travel too much. And we accept it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they can't accept one Jew in the building. Do you worry for the future of Israel? Well, it's, I certainly do. But I'm sure we'll survive. Mm -hmm. Because Israel has a fantastic ingenuity. We're far ahead of everybody in terms of uh, all the, uh, the sciences that create all the necessary weapons to, to protect you. I want to tell you another joke, your mm. joke. If it's my joke, I'll be glad to listen. Thank God it's not your joke. <laughs> it has to do with <laughs> what you hear an audience say when it's intermission time, whether they're Jewish or not Jewish. Uh, this is okay? Right. You know what I'm talking about. Right. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to give you a chance to go into the into the uh, lobbies and discuss the show. Jews have to discuss the show. That's more important than the whole show is to, is to express their opinion, their opinion. <laughs> Gentiles will go out for a drink and Jews will say, let's grab a little something and discuss. <laughs> They'll start to get together. What do you think of this man? Not for me. You think you'll, you think you'll go back in? Why not? It's a place to sit. Where are you going to go? <laughs> the Gentiles will be discussing the show, not the Jews. Every Jew will be asking the same question. How much do you think he gets for a show like this? Well, I know what the joke you mean is uh, how every Jew asks the same question in the mission. Yes. How old do you think he is? <laughs> because because it, the older you get, the more people want to know how old you are because they want to feel young in comparison. Nobody asks how old you are when you're 35 because they don't feel concerned. But as people get older, they're fearful of aging, and they're fearful of the whole idea of death. And it preoccupies them whether they know it or not half of the time. Mm -hmm. So they're always hoping it makes them feel better to find out that somebody is older. So they're always looking for, the older you are, the more they'll ask, how old do you think he is? Because they're hoping you should be at least 30 years older than them.
<laughs> and no matter what age you told him, it's not enough. You told him, I, I think he's about 78. Bullshit. <laughs> They'll blow their top at you. He's at least 97. Who are you kidding? They want you to be so old that, you, that they should feel sure that you're about to pass away in an hour. And if they hear you die, they're even happier. You tell them somebody just died. They'll say, oh my God, that's so horrible. He actually died, that's terrible. Then somebody else pops up. What are you talking about? He didn't die, he's sick, but he's not, he's not dead. And when they hear that, they get mad. <laughs> what do you mean he's not dead? He died. <laughs> but he didn't die, I just saw him on Tite Street. So what? You saw him before he died. But I just saw him an hour ago. So maybe he died 20 minutes ago. <laughs> he you has know, to be died like, because this guy doesn't lie. <laughs> They'll even go looking for the body to make sure it's, it's definite. <laughs> the other thing I've heard you do right. is that during intermission, every Jew wants one thing while the Gentile wants something else. Are you going to tell the, me that we have to do The Jew wants you want me to a do? piece of cake, right. right? And the Gentile says... Have a drink. Have a drink. There is something, by the way, about the Jewish people where... We always want cake. <laughs> Am I right? That was true from the old Jews. I don't think it's true today anymore. Mm -hmm. That changed a lot. A cake was a, was a kind of, uh, of security for Jews, to, uh -huh. to know that they have something to eat and they, kept, they felt like eating all the time. That was, that was symbolic of, of being comfortable. And a Jew was always comfortable with a piece of cake in his mouth. Mm -hmm. To know that... <laughs> that he's secured, that he could afford such a luxury, that he has no, not only bread, he also has cake. But kids today don't feel that. I don't see young kids coming into a coffee shop looking for cake. <laughs> Watch two, old, two people coming into a coffee shop, and you'll always notice the old people are looking for a piece of cake, and the kids, you look at their table, you don't see any cake, you only see coffee. <laughs> Will young people appreciate your humor? Not only do they appreciate it, they fly from the furniture. They, they obviously left tremendously at all this stuff uh -huh, uh -huh. because they, they still know the older generation and a lot of my stuff is strictly for the new generation. I make, like I do a whole routine about Starbucks. You don't have to be old to, to know about Starbucks. As a matter of fact, that routine leaves out the old because most of the old Jews never been in Starbucks. <laughs> so that becomes a routine that's only for the young. But I keep in touch with what's happening today so it's impossible for young people not to enjoy my act. Because if, if it's only appropriate for older people, I wouldn't even do that joke anymore. If, if, I'm very aware of what, what people of all ages are aware of. I'm not going to talk about things that they haven't experienced. Yes. Do you feel there is a Jewish character to humor? Has humor been, in some way, the way in which the Jew has dealt with historical suffering? Of course, everybody knows that the people who are suffering always have, always are attracted to comedy to, to alleviate the pain. It's an outlet for people to escape from the from misery. If when you feel like you're going through a rough day, you'll, you'll be more in the mood to see a comedy, to go to the movies to watch a comedy. If you've had, if you've had been laughing all day, it's easier for you to tolerate something that, uh, about human misery. People don't know it; they're not consciously aware of it. But the mood changes in accordance to your to your, to your latest experiences. Mm -hmm. And you want to see different things that, that you know. Do you notice if you sit on a chair like this, you're not even aware of it, but after a certain amount of time, you'll find yourself sitting like this. People, people <laughs> change in accordance to what, uh, what's affecting them, whether they know it or not. This has been extraordinarily kind of you. And you know, I, I, first of all, when, you, when I've seen you in, in some circumstances, there is that quick, wit and banter and I am so grateful that you really gave me a lot of your heart and soul in this interview. I wanted the audience to understand what a very very special human being you are and very often you, know, you see somebody on stage, you see them on film, you see them on television and you might really enjoy whatever they do whether it's singing or humor whatever but you don't understand what the real human being is and you have been an extraordinary presence your whole life you started very young honing a craft that you as i've said before you have left an indelible unique mark on the american scene on the american culture 
and I hope you do this for generations yet to come. It's been an honor sitting thank with you, you and you. I thank you, Jackie Mason. Thank Kol you. Tuvha, only great success and health for you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'm glad it worked out. That was my meeting with Jackie Mason. I hope you enjoyed meeting him as much as I did. As always, feel free to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to the things Jackie had to say. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, tweet me. I look forward to hearing from you. And by the way, if you'd like to be in touch with Jackie Mason yourself, you can email me. I will forward your emails on to him. And finally, my best wishes to all of you who will be celebrating the holiday of Passover. May you all have a zisin Pesach, a joyous, warm, family-filled Passover holiday. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support. L'chaim is a presentation of Jewish education in media.